that's what they say But no one's saying It's in the room It's right in the middle, can't you see it? I say There's an elephant in this room There's an elephant in this room What kind of questions are coming out of you? What do you want to say now? We'll get it out of you Don't be afraid to ask it Cause no one's saying it But everyone is thinking it There's an elephant in the room There's an elephant in the room There's an elephant in the room Skip it up on both elephant in the room Can't you see him? He's right in front of you. <laughs> Scatting for you guys. Scatting for you. I guarantee you after four weeks, you'll be singing that. I'm telling you. There is no doubt. You can pick it up on the stream. It's going to go crazy, Josiah. I don't know if you know that, but I can't wait. Anyways, um, I'm so pumped for today. We had an amazing 9 a.m. experience. Last night, we got to spend time with Linda, and so we've got a special guest that's going to help us get this started, um, because sometimes you need an expert in the field to help you, and there's no doubt we're, we're living in a culture of sex, sex, it's not just sex, okay. I'm so excited. <laughs> Sexual confusion and chaos. Woo! Um, I'm just pumped for you to hear the message because it's a message we all need to hear. Um, when I got a phone call from Linda, uh, we, we connected a few months ago. I mean, uh, they were looking for a church to host uh, the conference tomorrow and today. And I'm like, this is what we're called to. Amen. We are called to speak the truth, but to do it in love and compassion, built on love. And so Dr. Linda is a specialist in this. She's got her Ph.D., all right, um, in uh, this exact subject we're talking about today. Everybody say street cred, because you need some street cred with that. And um, she obviously has her master's, uh, is an Assemblies of God pastor, but more than that, um, she loves people and loves the gospel, and that is what I have enjoyed the most. So I want you guys to give a huge 2911 welcome to Dr. Linda Silo. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Mark. I thought you were going to go into like doing a little scat right there or speak in tongues. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> hey, well, my name's Linda and I, hi, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm from Indiana. It's a joy to be with you guys in the uh, lack of humidity here. Um, it's a dry heat. That's our joke. It's a dry heat. Um, and it's, it's hot. It feels like somebody, I'm in the oven. Um, and I'm at that age where you start experiencing hot flashes, so it's like I'm in the oven and then somebody turned the broiler on. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? It is really hot in Arizona. So anyway, uh, before we jump in, I wanted to let you know I am wearing one earring in case you didn't notice. Um, I'm self-conscious about that. You may have never noticed, but I can't wear it on this side because it hits the microphone. And so my other earring is in my pocket. It looks just like this one. <laughs> And I'm not trying to do, for those of you who are over 40, a George Michael impression from Wham. <laughs> Although if you don't know who that is and you look it up, you might realize why that's actually kind of funny given what we're talking about today. But anyway, I'm going to jump into the message. Focus. Okay, come back. Um, all right, so I am a missionary with the Assemblies of God. Uh, yay! Yeah. And I work with Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship, which is the Assemblies of God Outreach to the Secular University. And... Um, I, like every good missionary, need to show you a picture of my family before we begin. So uh, my first family member I'd like to share with you is Boaz. This is my Boaz right here. There he is. <laughs> That's my boy. I call him Bo. That's his baby picture. He's five years old now, and he no longer fits in my hand. In fact, he doesn't even fit on my lap. He's ginormous. Um, but he wasn't a snuggler when I first got him, and so I um, wanted a, a, a snuggly kitty. So I, I got little Tabitha. You can see her in the next picture, laying across my chest. There's Tabby. I love my little girl. Uh, she's half the size of Bo. So you can see him sitting on the back of that couch there. Um, but anyway, those are my snugglers, and uh, I don't know how I turned into a 40-something-year-old woman with two cats, but there you have it. Um, in addition to serving as a Chi Alpha missionary, I also serve as the executive director of a ministry called Restory Ministries, like God is rewriting your story. And um, I'm going to share some references, some resources at the end of the service here. Uh, but Restory was started as a 501c3 specifically to equip churches how to address LGBTQ and how to demonstrate compassion without compromising the truth of God's word. 
which is one I, I want to talk about you, uh, about you. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm going to talk to you about that this morning. So well, clearly we need to pray before we jump in. So. <laughs> Lord, help. <laughs> we just pray for your presence here, and I, I pray the words of my mouth would come out clearly, and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, Lord. And that you would help us as we look at this topic through the lens of your word. God, would you help us in the midst of our challenging culture today to know how to represent you well, to be salt, to be light, and, and to just to image your love to the world that is around us. And help us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, the reason why I'm passionate about this topic is because of my own story. So from my earliest memory, I wanted to be a little boy instead of a little girl. And you can see in the first picture here that I was quite boyish. Uh, people would we'd go out to eat at a restaurant and people would go around the table and ask my mom and dad and my sister what they want to drink. And they'd get to me and say, sir, what do you want to drink? And I was like, yes, you know who I really am, you know. Now, this was back in the 1970s, and nobody used the word transgender. Nobody even knew what that was. I didn't know what that was. I just knew that I felt like I should have been a boy, and that was my absolute obsession. I wanted to be a boy. I wanted to physically change my body to become a boy and all of that. In the next picture, you can see I was quite a tomboy. My parents just thought it was a phase. You know, a lot of little girls like to climb trees, play outside, instead of be inside, play with Barbies like my older sister. And they thought it was probably just a phase I would grow out of. But I knew this wasn't a phase. Like in my mind, masculinity was my destiny. And when I was around nine years old, little boy pushed me into the boys' restroom and I saw this wall of urinals and I was like, what is that? <laughs> I didn't know there was a way the other half lived. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, anyway, that, that became like a symbol of that forbidden world that I couldn't be a part of, part of that I desperately wanted to enter. And from that point forward, I began visiting boys' restrooms and uh, even men's restrooms as I got older and pretend to use a urinal and men would walk in and out, not bad an eye because I looked so much like a boy that I belonged in there. And I was like, yes, you know who I really am. And that actually turned into a sexual fetish that I, and, and addictions sexually that I just couldn't get free from for decades. And I was too ashamed to tell anybody what was going on, but it was just, it was symbolic of that forbidden world I so desperately wanted to be a part of. Now, around the same time, I heard about these things that back in the 70s we called sex change operations, or uh, today they call it gender affirmation surgery. To be clear, you cannot actually change your sex. So we image God in the way that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we are made in his image male and female, and we retain our sexuality, male and female, yesterday, today, and forever. My DNA will forever be, even in my glorified body, XX chromosomes. And likewise, men, XY. That's who God created us to be. Jesus, when he came back, it was resurrected in a human body. He came back, they recognized him as Jesus, the male, the son of God, right? So we retain that. Now, that was horrifying to me growing up as a kid to think I would be trapped in this body for the rest of my life. But the reality is we image God, and you can't change your sex. What you do is you can rearrange the skin on your body to make it look like you're the opposite sex, but we can't actually change who God designed us to be. Sex is not assigned at birth. It's designed by our creator who knit us together in our mother's womb. Amen? I didn't know that. Okay, so I'm nine years old, and I'm thinking, I can go to a hospital one day as Linda and come out the next day as David. And I was like, oh, for real? Sign me up. So I was like, as soon as I have enough money and I'm old enough, I will change my name to David and have this sex change and live happily ever after. So I get into junior high, and it was around sixth grade. You can see in the next picture, rather androgynous, uncomfortable in my own skin. And while the other girls around me were boy crazy and wanting to blossom into womanhood, I despised that world and my own body that was showing signs of femininity. I wanted nothing to do with that. And I became intensely jealous of the boys around me whose voices were changing and they were becoming everything I dreamed of being. And around that same time, I discovered that not only did I want to be a man, I found myself attracted sexually to women. I didn't choose that. I didn't want that. Yet I felt helpless to change it. 
And so I'm trying to make sense of my world. Back then, this is in the 1980s, nobody's talking about sexuality. There was no safe zone. There was no LGBTQ club. There was no culture that was affirming this and accepting it. You were ostracized. You were made fun of. You were shamed if you came out with an alternative identity or admitted you were attracted to the same sex. So it was not safe to tell my family or anybody else. So I'm by myself trying to reason through and make sense of life. And I thought to myself, you know, if I really am a man trapped in a female body, then I should be attracted to women. That just makes me a straight man. So that's how I made sense of my reality as a little sixth grader. And I thought to myself, well, I just need to hold out until I can have the sex change operation, and then all the stars will align and my life will make sense and I will live happily ever after. So as I got into late junior high, you can see in the next picture, still rather androgynous and boyish, and I'm thinking through the ramifications of that decision in a way that you don't think through when you're nine years old because your brain hasn't matured yet. But I started thinking, well, wait, wait a minute. How do I, how do I tell people? How, how do I, you don't just, you know, go to the hospital one day as Linda, come out the next day as David, and they don't know. At some point, they're going to know. So how do I tell them? And I thought, I'm, I'm not sure how my parents would respond. Will they still love me? Will they reject me? I hoped they would. What about my sister? What, about, what would the neighbors think? What would my grandparents think? You know, I'm thinking through this in a way I hadn't thought through before. And I was so ashamed of what was going on. And I literally thought I was the only person on planet Earth who ever felt these feelings. No clue that any other people had felt this way. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I think I only have two options here. I can run away, have the surgery, change my name to David and live happily ever after and just never see my family again and get what I want. Or I cannot have the surgery and keep my family but know that it will consign me to a life of suicidal despair and loneliness because I, I really hated myself. I hated my body. I, I, I wanted to end it all because I was so miserable. And I remember the day that I was walking down the hall in junior high school and I literally chose option B. And I said to myself, you know what? This is just what you have to do to survive. And from that point forward, I made a decision. I'm going to have to put a little effort in here to try to not look so androgynous so nobody ever knows my deep, dark secret. So I'm going to grow my hair out a little bit. So I, next picture you'll see at some sports pictures from my freshman, sophomore year in high school. I had a mullet for a period of time, which I'm not proud of. <laughs> But in my defense, the internet did not exist, and I didn't know about the website, friendsdontletfriendsgetmullets.com. <laughs> so anyway, it was a popular hairstyle for male soccer players at the time. So anyway, so I, I grow my hair out. I'm trying to not look so androgynous. And then I, then I would came up with a plan to cure myself. And this, this was my plan. I was going to invite a boy from my physics class to the turnabout dance and... Um, you know, start to experiment sexually with boys in hopes that it would like awaken something that's dormant in me. Because maybe I'm just not attracted to boys because I've never dated a boy. And so here I am, I borrowed a dress from my sister and I'm standing like a football player next to Brian. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there were no sparks flying that night. <laughs> but it was my first attempt of many uh, to try to date boys and experiment sexually with them, which they were all too happy to comply. But what I discovered over time, <laughs> it's true, it's sad but true, what I discovered over time was that it didn't awaken anything dormant in me. All it did was make me more jealous. I wanted to be the man with the woman, not the woman with the man. And even when I would dress up in those things, I, I actually, my junior and senior year, borrowed the same dress from my sister and went to prom in the same dress two years in a row. Uh, but you can see me in the, the prom dress. I just felt like a man dressed in drag. Like, I just, I was so uncomfortable in my own skin that this is me wearing a costume, trying to fit the part and do what's expected of you so nobody knows my deep, dark secret. But I was absolutely miserable on the inside. Now, my junior year in high school, I heard the gospel for the first time, and nobody had to tell me that I was a sinner separated from God, that I deserved judgment for my sin because I had all sorts of sexual addictions and things going on behind closed doors. I had the little fetish with urinals, and I had things happening where I was exposed to pornography through some childhood friends early on. I was not proud of those things. I felt such deep shame and condemnation and guilt, and I thought, surely, if anybody deserves hell, I, I'm pretty sure I do. Um, and so I, I prayed to receive Christ that night, hoping that all this would go away, because if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation, right? The old is gone, the new is here. And so I wake up the next morning equally attracted to women and desiring to be a man, and now I'm like, oh no, 
Now I'm in a real catch-22 because I got involved with the body of Christ, but nobody was talking about these issues in secular culture. And they for sure were not talking about that in the body of Christ. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I was like, all right, now I got to fool people. I got to fake it till you make it. So nobody will ever know. So I'm doing everything I know to play the part. And I'm, I'm just miserable. And in college, I got involved in a campus ministry. And I, I did have a genuine, legit conversion experience with Jesus, where I met him and my life changed. I started reading for the Bible on my own, started experiencing just desires to go after God and live for his kingdom, but I also had all this stuff going on behind closed doors. And you can only live for so long lukewarm. We've got one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world until you hit that breaking point where you say, you know what, I either need to go all out after Jesus or all out after my sin, but I, I can't live in this middle ground anymore. It's miserable. So because you can't enjoy your sin. You're like convicted the whole time. It's no fun. So anyway, I, I uh, hit a point my, my senior year in college where I heard this speaker talking about if you're in habitual repetitive sin and you can't get free, the answer is James 5.16. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And I knew I would never be set free from what I was dealing with behind closed doors unless I took what was in the darkness and brought it into the light with a trusted leader. And when you do that, it breaks the power of the enemy to energize that sin and hold you captive to it. Amen? So I decided to take a risk. Now, this was December of 1994. And I decided to tell my campus pastor my deepest, darkest secret. Now, you have to understand, they were recruiting me to come on staff with this campus ministry after I graduated. I was leading a Bible study. I was leading worship and, you know, really what part of the core group there. And I took a risk, and I, I, I was going to tell my campus pastor, John, and I thought to myself, you know, he could, he could react by exposing my sin, shaming me, kicking me out of the group, pulling me out of leadership, saying, I can't believe we ever thought we would recruit you to be on staff. And I, but I was so desperate to know, is freedom even possible, and can I get help? I just decided to take a risk. It was the scariest decision of my life. I actually almost took my life before meeting with him because I was so terrified to tell anybody else what was going on. By God's grace, I didn't follow through with that plan, and I met with John, and I shared my deepest, darkest secret, and I'm inside, I'm kind of wincing, expecting, not sure what to expect with his response, and after I, as a 21-year-old, told this middle-aged married man my deepest, darkest secret about my own sexuality, which, let's be honest, was rather awkward, um, he looked me in the eyes, and he said, Linda, thank you for sharing that with me. I know that took a lot of courage. And I want you to know that doesn't change our opinion of you. We love you. We see the hand of God on your life. And we want to get you the help that you need. Amen. <clears throat> My friends, that was a phenomenal response for 1994. It'd be a phenomenal response today. And I'm so grateful that John responded by demonstrating compassion without compromising the word of God because I wouldn't be standing here today otherwise. And I walked away from that conversation, and I, I was, in my head, I was like, what was that? What, what, what just happened? And I sensed the Lord speak to my heart, not in an audible voice, but I just sensed the Lord saying, what you just saw, Linda, was a picture of me. I love you. I'm sad that you're hurting, and I want to get you the help that you need. Now, I I had never seen God that way. I thought God hated me, even though, you know, Jesus died for me, but he, like, kind of had to love me because he's God and that's his job. But I didn't think he really liked me. <laughs> and I, I never saw God as compassionate or for me or wanting to help me in any way. And that was the first step in what was to be an 11-year journey of transformation in my life. Now, I didn't know it would be 11 years, <laughs> or I may not have signed up for the trip. <laughs> but discipleship is messy. Discipleship is a process. And while I say, well, it was 11 years, that was the most intense part, the 11 years. The reality is, I'm still in process. Each day that we walk with Jesus, we walk further and further away from our past and into the fullness of who he created us to be. <laughs> Amen. And I'm not saying, oh, there's some pie in the sky and I could never be tempted again and I don't have vulnerabilities or I forgot my history or any of that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is I'm no longer a slave to what used to master me. And I no longer thirst for those things that used to consume me. 
I thirst for other things. Why? Because Jesus satisfied the thirst in my soul with good things. He fills the hungry and he satisfies the thirsty with good things. Amen? Now, as I was walking through this, I didn't know that's how the story was going to end. As I'm in the middle of it and I'm in college, my senior year in college, before I confessed to my campus pastor, I was wondering, am I born this way? Is change even possible? Because our culture says born that way can't change, especially now. And back then, in the 90s, they actually had people, scientists, that were saying, oh yeah, we found proof that you're born that way. We found a gay gene, and you're born that way. We found a structure in your brain that if you have this structure, you're going to be gay. And today, one of the popular arguments is, Linda, you were probably exposed to too many androgens in the womb, a hormone that masculinized your brain, but it didn't masculinize your body. So you ended up with a female body, but a masculine brain. That's a popular argument today. What I didn't know back then is that those popular arguments each have been debunked. For something to become an official scientific theory, you have to have the same control, same variable, and same result, right? Now, it made the headlines when they thought they found a gay gene. It was trumpeted over all the news media. When they thought there was a structure in your brain that makes you gay, all over the news media. But when those experiments were not replicated, and in fact debunked, that didn't make the headlines. And this narrative in our culture that you're born gay can't change gained more and more momentum to the point where if you ask anybody in Gen, Gen Z, are people born gay? Oh, absolutely. It's on the same level as skin color or race. You're born that way and so we can't discriminate against you because it's something that you can't help. You're just simply born that way. I'm not suggesting we discriminate against people. But what I'm saying is it's not on the same level in your DNA as skin color or race. In fact, we have technology now called genome-wide association studies, which allows us to look at millions of genomes, millions of genes at once, to see is there any statistical correlation between those that have a particular genome pattern and those who experience same-sex attractions. In the latest study in 2019, with a half million people, nearly, looking at millions of genes, guess what they found? Zero statistical statistically significant evidence saying if you have a particular genome, a particular pattern of genes, that you are going to end up with same-sex attractions. The idea that you have a structure in your brain that makes you gay, we have now since discovered, since the 90s, oh, wait a minute, there's something called neuroplasticity, that your brain actually changes in response to the culture and to the things you expose it to. That's actually consistent with scripture that says you can literally renew your mind. You can build new neural pathways, and it can actually change. Did you know if a man is addicted to pornography, you can do an fMRI of his brain, and you can see the patterns, and if he goes 90 days without looking at pornography and starts to renew his mind and build new patterns and new coping strategies with stress and things that feed into pornography, you can do an fMRI and see the changes in his brain. When you renew your mind, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Oh, you're just a porn addict. You're going to be that way the rest of your life. You're born gay. It's never going to change. Nope. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's scriptural. It's scientific and scriptural. Amen. So I didn't know about all those studies to come out. All I heard was what was popular in the 1990s. I didn't know that even the concept of being exposed to hormones in the womb, people would say, um, it, that doesn't explain why two identical twins who experience the exact same hormonal environment in the womb, and yet one can embrace a transgender or gay identity and the other does not. How do you explain that if they had the exact same exposure to hormones? What we're discovering now is there doesn't appear to be anything genetically or biologically that hardwires your sexuality. Your sexuality is so much more complicated than that. And it has to do with the fact that we are spirit, soul, and body. And your mind, emotions, and will, what you think, what you feel, what you choose, actually impacts your physical drives and desires. So if you take thoughts captive and you renew your mind and you replace lies with truth, it can actually change your feelings and your desires. Have you ever been mad at somebody and you didn't want to forgive them and some painful thing happened and you made all these assumptions about them and whatever and you just felt hatred in your heart towards them? You just felt it. And then over a season of time, they come to you and say, I am so sorry, and you realized it was a misperception and you had all this hatred towards them, but then you realize that wasn't their motive, and all of a sudden your heart changes? Yeah. What happened? Your mind changed, the circumstances changed, and the feelings of your heart followed suit. 
Did you know your sexuality is similar? What you think on can affect even your sexual desires and what you feel. But I didn't know any of that. So as I'm confessing to my campus pastor and I'm wondering, you know, is he going to reject me? Is he going to kick me out of the group? But he responds in this phenomenal way by demonstrating compassion without compromising the truth of God. He didn't say, oh, Linda, uh, that's okay. We love you and we accept you and just embrace that gay identity and go marry a woman and we'll be there at your wedding day to celebrate with you. He didn't do that. And he didn't say, well, just go ahead and be a gay Christian. Don't act on it because that would be immoral, but embrace the gay Christian identity. He didn't do that. Of course, that wasn't popular back then like it is today. But he said, we love you and we want to help you. And he came alongside me and connected me with people and resources that got me set on a trajectory of transformation in my life. Now, what's true, according to Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 says this. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's a strong statement. Do not be deceived Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, slanderers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. That's good news, my friend. Now, here's the interesting thing. In today's culture, we are persuaded that LGBTQ is different than any kind of struggle somebody may have. So if you struggle with that, you're born that way, can't change, it's immutable, it's, it's immune to the power of God. And yet scripture doesn't treat it that way. Here's a very clear reference to the homosexual act, and yet it's couched in the context of other things that we know are sins that actually in this room we have all struggled with to some degree. It talks about greedy people. Any, anybody here ever struggled with greed, wanting stuff for yourself, being selfish and denying it to other people, right? Or it just talks about sexual immorality in general. It doesn't have to be a gay sex. What about heterosexually? Have you ever looked at porn and stuff online you shouldn't be looking at? Have you ever had thoughts about somebody that's not your spouse? Have you, have you ever struggled with your sexuality to any degree? Idolatry. Have you ever put a relationship above God or some kind of an activity and idolized that instead of worshiping the Lord? I mean, we have all struggled with these sins to some degree, right? And yet we don't think it's weird that somebody who used to be greedy, God transforms their life, and now they're a generous person. We don't think it's weird that somebody who who used to idolize money or idolize a relationship and, and is able to lay that down and say, Lord, I want you to be the foremost center of my life. We don't think that's weird. We don't think it's strange when a guy that's or a gal that's addicted to pornography and it's absolutely ruling their life and yet they get stuff into the light and they get accountability and they begin renewing their mind and figuring out why am I turning to this as a maladaptive coping mechanism instead of getting my pain out with the Lord and processing with him so I don't have to turn to these things to find release, right? We don't think that's weird when people are transformed. And yet somehow culture has convinced us when it comes to same-sex attractions or gender dysphoria, oh, no, that, you can't be set free from that. Born gay can't change. Born trans can't change. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Actually, the whole concept of sexual orientation is made up. That just came about 150 years ago, which is very recent in history. In fact, there's a lie going around right now that the word homosexual was wrongly mistranslated and put into the Bible in 1946, and we have misled an entire generation based on the mistranslation of one word. That's an argument from the 1980s that's being recycled as if it's some newfangled thing. It's not. There's no truth to that. Now, now, there's a seed of truth to it. The word homosexual didn't exist 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul was used of God to pen 1 Corinthians. That word didn't exist because it just came about 150 years ago. The concept, as we just read in that scripture, of men having sex with men, or in the book of Romans, women having unnatural relations with other women, that concept has been around since Genesis. Okay? So the Bible talks about this action and saying, hey, this is not God's design for your sexuality. And it's consistent from Genesis all the way through Revelation. You will not find a single scripture that says, this is the way you practice gay sex in a righteous way. <laughs> it's just not there. <laughs> it is between a man and a woman in the context of marriage, one man, one woman in a covenant relationship. Don't be doing sex outside of that, right? But there's no righteous way to fulfill a same-sex relationship. The Bible is consistent, and yet we create this concept that there is such a thing as a sexual orientation or a homosexual to, or gay or whatever, and the reality is that's made up to justify gay sex. 
There's no such thing as an orientation. What an orientation does is it takes the action, men who have sex with men, and say, oh, this isn't just an action of your body, it's a state of being, it's who you are, I'm gay. It's, it's you know, going from the action to the gay person, the homosexual, whatever word you want to use for that. The concept that there is this inborn, innate identity and these desires that are fixed and immutable and they do not change. That's not consistent with the word of God and it's ac actually not consistent with lived reality and even what science shows us about neuroplasticity in the brain and spirit, soul, and body all being connected. Ephesians 4.22 describes it this way. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's what my same-sex attractions and my desire to be a man were. They were deceitful desires. They were lying to me. And when you're deceived, you don't even know you're being deceived. It felt real. It felt true. I'm not lying to you. The attractions to women felt so real. The desire to be a man consumed my life. It, it wasn't a false reality at all. It wasn't a fantasy. It was real pain. It was real anguish that I was experiencing. But scripture talks about those being deceitful desires that are corrupting me, and it's part of the old self. And I am commanded to put the old self off, not embrace it and identify myself by it. And it says, I am to be made new in the attitude of my mind, build new neural pathways, and to put on the new self to be created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so this is what scripture talks about, this process of transformation that scripture calls it progressive sanctification. Theologically, that's what it's called. It's a lifelong process of putting off the old, being made new in the attitude of our mind, and putting on the new, becoming who God has created us to be. Did you know the Holy Spirit inside of me, the regenerate part of me, does not want to be a man? Did you know the regenerate part of me is not attracted to women? And yet we, we feel these desires, and we feel like my desires dictate my identity and determine my destiny. Nope, those are just deceitful desires. A desire is just that. It's just a desire. And we have to recognize, since we are spirit, soul, and body, those desires are connected to what we think. And what we think affects how we feel. And what we feel affects what we choose and what we do with our body. It's all connected. So what we see among those who experience struggles with their sexuality is many times several common factors. Now, there's no formula because we're all unique. We all struggle. We all break in different ways and, and we respond to different things in our lives based on our personality temperament, based on our life history and family background and things like that. But some common things that we see that were true in my own life and also true in my research for my PhD, 30 case studies of men and women who were formerly same-sex attracted and have experienced transformation. And there were three things that just kept coming up and coming up and coming up again that were very common among those who struggle with their sexuality. The first one was gender nonconformity, where, say, a little boy doesn't fit the stereotype we have of a rough-and-tumble, athletic, masculine boy, right? Instead, he's got a sensitive temperament, personality temperament. He's in touch with his emotions. He's artistic. He's sensitive. He's musical. He would rather be in the kitchen cooking than out in the yard playing ball. And he goes to school as a little five-year-old. And what do the boys call him? You're a sissy, or other derogatory names, right? And that is traumatic to a little boy not to fit in with his peers. And as he's growing up, he goes, what's wrong with me? Why don't I fit in? Is there something deficient about my masculinity? Am I not really a boy? And of course, there's an enemy of his soul who whispers in his ear and says, yes, that's right. You're different. There's something wrong, deficient with your masculinity. You're gay. That same little boy who is not experiencing connection with boys at school, at home may not be experiencing connection with his earthly father. And God designed each of us to have a mommy and a daddy where the mommy would invite the girl to join the world of woman and the daddy would invite the son to join the world of man. And only a man can invite another man into manhood. Only a woman can invite another woman into womanhood. And if for some reason there's a breakdown in that relationship, and that little boy decides, I, I don't think I fit into the world of man because his dad is this masculine, rough-and-tumble athletic guy, and he's not like the sensitive temperament son. And that father can have the best of intentions and do his best to love his son well. But if that little son, from his perception, says, I don't think my dad loves me like he loves my athletic brother because my athletic brother likes to go in the yard and play football, and I don't like to do that. 
and my dad doesn't know how to connect with me. And the dad may have the best intentions, but he doesn't know that maybe what I need to do for this artistic son is go to the pottery barn and do pottery with him and make him feel loved in a way that's meaningful to him. And the dad may not know that. He's doing the best he can with what he has. And if that child perceives that he's not loved, even though that's not true, the dad loves him, but if the child perceives, his perception trumps reality. And he can come away with the mindset that, you know, I just, there's something wrong with me. I'm not a, a boy among boys like my brother is with my dad. And the enemy says, oh yeah, that's right, because there's something deficient in your masculinity. That same little boy who's being made fun of at school, maybe feeling isolated at home for a variety of reasons, he can go, uh, you know, out in public and pedophiles know how to groom those that they're going to prey upon. And that same little boy can become vulnerable to the advances of a grown man because he can see this little boy doesn't fit in and he needs attention. I'll give him attention. I'll give him male love in an inappropriate way. And then the little boy goes, wow, I wanted his attention and that but why did he choose me and not the athlete? Why did my body respond that way? Does that mean I'm gay? And of course the enemy says, oh yes, you're gay. And it will reinforce that. And that, those things can get lodged into his soul. Those lies and those painful experiences, that trauma, can be lodged into him as a five-year-old, as an eight-year-old, as a 10-year-old. That doesn't go away because we are spirit, soul, and body. And when he grows up and he experiences you know, sexual drives and attractions and things like that, if there is a thirst for male love in his heart that did not get met the way God designed, he will long for that male love and it can become confused with his sexual drives and desires. And it can feel like he's attracted to men when really it's just a cry of a little boy longing for masculine love in a legitimate way. That's what happened to me. I rejected my mom at a young age despite her best intentions to mother me. I rejected her. My perception was, you're weak, you're emotional. I don't like that, and I want to be more like dad, the strong, silent, you know, masculine type. Instead of pretending to put on makeup like my sister would with my mom, I'm in the bathroom pretending to shave like dad and mow the lawn. You know, I'm just missing that milestone in my childhood. And it left me with a vacuum for feminine love. And that left me vulnerable to the advances of a junior high teacher who gave me inappropriate love, another woman that took advantage of me. And it confused me sexually. And getting exposed to pornography and all these other things in my life that reinforce the lie, it's not safe to be a woman, it's not good to be a woman, men are not safe. So when I grew up and my sexual drives and desires kicked in, why would I be, want to be vulnerable with a man if I don't think men are safe? And why would I want to be a woman if I, I don't feel like being a woman is a desirable thing? And so that thirst for feminine love that didn't get met the way God designed through my own mother, despite her best intentions, left that vacuum in my heart that the enemy saw all too fit to find ways to fill in unrighteous ways. And so it can feel like you're born that way, but really it's, it's, it's not a genetic issue, a biological issue, it's a developmental issue where I missed crucial developmental milestones in my life and it affected my psychosexual development. So in my own life, God did a transformation where I went from being this androgynous woman, as you can see in the first picture on the left, totally uncomfortable in my own skin and my own body, to he began to change me from the inside out, and eventually my external appearance changed to the point my parents didn't even recognize me when I went home to visit them because my appearance changed in such a short period of time. As you can see in the next picture, it was very surprising to them, but it was a delight and it was a joy at the same time. This time, I wasn't doing that to try to put on a costume and fool anybody. This time, I was genuinely wanting to step into who God created me to be because God used redemptive relationships in the body of Christ with spiritual moms. There was a particular spiritual mom God really used to speak into my life and to love me, and she wasn't threatened by my attractions. I was madly attracted to her, but the Lord helped me objectify those attractions and realize, wow, it's not really a sexual issue. I'm just longing for feminine love. And she was able to love me in a healthy, wholesome way that wasn't sexual. And God began to use that to meet that need for love in my life. And he also used inner healing prayer to heal the wounds in my heart and to, to, to replace the lie that it's better to be a man than a woman. There are some things God spoke directly to my heart in inner healing prayer that absolutely transformed me forever. And so I stand before you today as a woman who is content in a female body. I'm not sneaking into the men's restroom in between services. <laughs> I promise you. I'm not white knuckling it, you know, fake it till you make it. That's no, it's not, that's not what's happening. 
God has genuinely transformed me. And in my late 30s, these desires and attractions to men began to surface, surprisingly, which was awkward and thrilling all at the same time. And so now I'm, I'm in the game, y'all. I'm in the game. And it, praise God. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It's, it's really fun, actually. So anyway, okay, focus, come back. Um, all right. I'm going to land the ship. Okay, this, let's close. <laughs> how, how, do, how do we need to respond as believers today? We need to respond by demonstrating compassion without compromise. Yeah, yeah. Just, just like my campus pastor. And uh, three things that we need to do. The first one is this. We need to love everyone as a fellow human being made in the image of God. Yeah whether gay, straight, non-binary, however they identify, whatever their race, whatever their ethnicity, their culture, their religious background, whatever it might be. We love everyone as a fellow human being made in the image of God. But to love you doesn't mean that I affirm everything you believe and all the moral choices you make. That's not real love. God doesn't affirm all my poor moral choices and mistakes and all of that stuff. He loves me. I love the songs we were singing this morning about, oh man, there's so much grace and he loves me right in the middle of my mess. But he doesn't affirm my, he loves me enough not to leave me in the middle of my mess, right? <laughs> Amen. So I can love you and disagree with you. Disagreement is not denigration. I can, I use this example, uh, if we were go, to go out to eat and uh, let's say we had cupcakes for dessert and there were chocolate cupcakes and there were vanilla cupcakes. How many of you in this room, in the presence of vanilla, would choose chocolate every single time? Raise your hands, please. Okay, that's the majority of the room. It's always the majority because we know chocolate is superior. Now, how many, how many in the presence of chocolate would choose vanilla every single time? Okay, yeah, you all are trying to make noise like there's more of you, but there's not. But, see, now, now, Pastor Mark would choose vanilla every single time, and he's quite vocal about it. Is it possible... For us to go out to lunch, I choose chocolate, he chooses vanilla, and we vehemently disagree about the superiority of chocolate, even though we know I'm right. And is it possible that we would sit next to each other and say, I agree to disagree with you agreeably, and have a civil conversation over lunch, even though we disagree? Yes. It's possible. Now, I know LGBTQ is a little bit, you know, not as tame as cupcakes, right? <laughs> But it is possible to disagree with someone and still love them as a fellow human being made in the image of God. What we're doing in today's culture is we're elevating the second commandment to love our neighbor above the first. We need to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means I love the Lord and I love his word and I love his ways. And I'm not ashamed of him. His word says if I'm ashamed of him before others, he'll be ashamed of me before the Father. No, I, I don't want to be ashamed of him and what he stands for. His ways are higher than our ways. And why would I bow my knee to the fallen human being in front of me and want their approval more than I want the approval of God? I want to fear God more than I fear man. But you know what? We're in a culture, a cancel culture, that tells us if you don't agree with me, you hate me and then I'll cancel you. And we fear man more than we fear God. And I get it. It's tough. I, I, I fail in that all the time. It is tough. And I, I, one of my prayers all the time is, God, I pray I would delight in the fear of the Lord instead of the affirmation and praises of people. So the first thing is loving others as a fellow human being made in the image of God. But the second one is this. We can't compromise what the word says. We can't compromise God's design for sexuality. He has a reason behind that. So if I have, let's say I have some gay neighbors and I'm, I have them over for dinner and I love them as fellow human beings made in the image of God. I build relationship with them and I share life with them. And they decide they want to get quote unquote married. It's not a marriage in the eyes of God. And they invite me to their so-called wedding. What would I do? A lot of times we feel pressured to say, well, I, I guess I'll just go because I want them to know I love them and I, it would be awkward to not go or say something about that. So I just, you know, I'm going to go. But did you know the, the, the purpose of a wedding is different than having people over for dinner? The purpose of a wedding ceremony is to establish a valid covenant in the eyes of God. And to have a valid covenant, you have to have witnesses present. Even if you do a justice of the peace or whatever, you have to have a witness present. And so a, a covenant is not valid without witnesses. And there's a reason why a pastor used to stand up and say, if there's any reason why you think this man and this woman should not be joined together in holy matrimony, speak now or... 
So if I attend a wedding and I say, that's not a legitimate covenant in the eyes of God, I, I can't serve as a witness there. I can't participate in something that is directly opposed to God's design for sexuality. Now that's a tough position to be in. But I would have a face-to-face -face conversation. And I would say, I love you, and I love your partner. And you know, we're friends. You've been over my house for dinner. I love sharing life with you. But I, I thank you for inviting me to your wedding. I'm honored that you would consider me a friend and want me to be there on your special day. But I have to be honest with you. I follow Jesus and his design for sexuality. And in the eyes of God, this is not a legitimate covenant. And I love you guys. And uh, I disagree with the idea that this is a valid marriage in the eyes of God. And I can't participate in that to, to say I'm a witness to this. But I still love you guys. And I hope this doesn't affect our relationship. I still want to be friends with you. I hope this disagreement on this issue doesn't change our relationship. If it does, that's their choice, not mine. That's a hard conversation to have. And I, I can feel the cringe in the room even as I share that. Like, what? You know, that's where I've landed on this. You may come to a different conclusion, but that's where I've landed. The whole transgender pronoun thing. What do you do? There's a guy who does my golf grips when I go to the store, and I, I'm a golfer, and I, I get my clubs. Oh, all right, all right. Come on. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I'm go to the store, I get my clubs regripped, and there's this guy that helps me, and he's really knowledgeable, he's, he's helped me with my swing and all sorts of things. Well, I go in there a year later to get my clubs regripped, and all of a sudden he has long hair, he has grown breast tissue, he's clearly on hormones, and his name tag now says Teresa. And I was like, what? Now I go in there, and I don't say, you're not really Teresa, I know you're so-and-so, you know, and I talk him down, whatever. You know what, I don't even, I don't know the guy. I just know of him, but I, I don't have a relationship with him. I don't have trust. And so I treat him as a fellow human being made in the image of God. I say, thank you so much for regripping my clubs. You are so knowledgeable and your prompt service. I just truly appreciate your kindness today. Thank you so much. I looked him in the eyes and loved him. I didn't have to call him Teresa. I didn't have to call him her. I just love him. And I walk away from that conversation and I pray and I say, God, there must be some deep wounds of rejection there for him to want to reject who you created him to be. My friends, sex is not assigned at birth. It's designed by your creator who knit you together in your mother's womb. And so I want to love him well without unnecessarily offending. But if I have relationship with someone, let's say it's a teenager here at church. There's this whole fad right now among teenage girls. It's called rapid onset gender dysphoria. They don't necessarily feel like me from birth. They felt like a boy trapped in a girl body. But in their teenage years, it's now trendy to come out as non-binary or transgender or some alternative identity. And it's more of a, a social contagion, a maladaptive coping mechanism for pain in the heart. And they find affirmation when they come out as non-binary or this other identity, people shower them with affirmation on social media. And it serves as an artificial shield to peer rejection. And we all want peer approval during that phase of life, right? And these young girls, it's not that they're struggling the way I did, but they, they are struggling with understanding who they are. Who am I? If I don't measure up to the girl in the bikini on social media who's got the perfect body and I'll never be that, am I really a woman? And culture would say, yeah, you're not. Maybe you should adopt an alternative identity. And we need to come alongside these young girls. And if, if little Jennifer wants to be Johnny, we don't just start calling her Johnny. If I have relationship with her, I can sit down with her and say, Jenny, tell me more about what's going on. Why would you want to reject who God created you to be? Tell me more about that. What do you find desirable about being a man, appearing to be a man? What do you find not desirable about being a woman? And, and how can I, as another woman, come alongside her and help her step into the woman God created her to be, to pass that developmental milestone? These teenagers just don't know who they are. And culture is telling them, this is going to solve all your problems. Adopt this identity. You'll be loved by everyone, and all your problems will go away. One of the saddest things you'll find is if you go on YouTube and you look up the word detransitioner, is you'll find these women in their 20s who transitioned while they were teens, started taking testosterone, and their voice changed to become a man's voice. Their hairline recedes, they get five o'clock shadow, their body begins to change, and they do irreversible damage to their body. And four or five years later on testosterone, and some of them have hysterectomies and mastectomies, and, and they realize, wait a minute, this didn't fulfill, this didn't, my problems didn't go away. But now they're done, they're, they're, they're dealing with irreversible damage to their bodies. It's sad what the enemy is doing to destroy 
sexuality and even the very concept of gender, male and female altogether. That's why non-binary is so popular right now because the enemy hates that male and female are made in the image of God and it's very good. And it points, earthly marriage and sexuality points to the ultimate marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. Our sexuality images the gospel and the enemy hates it. He's trying to destroy it. But friends, we can't be afraid of speaking the truth in love. And if there's a teen girl that's struggling in that area, we need to come, we don't condemn her. We come alongside her and tell me more about what's going on. Something else that's popular with teen girls is to, is to adapt, uh, say, I'm, well, I'm bisexual, I'm attracted to women. And you know what? Some of them don't even understand what sexual attraction is. What they're dealing with is just a normal teenage developmental milestone. I find myself admiring this woman and the way she does her hair. I like the pants that she's wearing. I, I, I like this. I like feeling close to this person. And they think that means that's a sexual attraction. And they're just confused. And they just need us to come alongside them and help them in their confusion, in the pressures of this world, and say, honey, let me help you understand who you are and what those feelings are. And ask questions and talk openly about those things with our kids. We have those conversations demonstrating compassion without compromising the word of God. And then lastly, we need to understand that at their root, same-sex attractions and gender uh, dysphoria, transgender desires are really ultimately not a sexual issue. It's an emotional, relational issue. It's wounds in the soul, wounds of rejection that get lodged in the soul, embedded there, and the enemy takes advantage of that. But here's the good news. If there's a reason, there's a resolution. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He unraveled the things in my life, the lies and the things that that convinced me it was superior to be a man. The answer was not to rearrange the skin on my body to match my fallen mind. The answer was to renew my mind to match the body my creator has given me. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing greater than living in the fullness and the wholeness of who God created you to be. Nothing more joyful than that. Well, Pastor Mark is going to come and close us in prayer. And before he does that, I want to offer you a resource that we have here today through Restory Ministry. We have something called Quick Guides that help equip you how to respond to a variety of things related to LGBTQ. For example, if somebody comes to you and says, I experience same-sex attractions, what do you do? How do you navigate that conversation? Here's a quick guide that offers six or seven bullet points of how to steer the conversation and some resources at the bottom, books and videos that you can read, you can watch with them, you can talk about together. We have ones on somebody who struggles with gender dysphoria. Or what about these teenage girls with rapid onset gender dysphoria? Why are they struggling with that? And how do we help them? And what are some books and resources to help with that? Or the lie that the word homosexual was inserted wrongly into the Bible in 1946. We have a whole quick guide on that. I've printed out six of these quick guides into a little three-page packet, double-sided. And we have these available for you in the back. If, If each family, there's one for each family, if you want to take one and have a hard copy, that's free for your taking today. If you don't want the hard copy, all of these are available on restoryministries.org on our resource page. Just scroll down to quick guides and you can they're digital and you can print them out at home if you want those. We have a number of other books and resources and things on there to help guide you. We have a monthly newsletter that if you want to sign up for the newsletter, you can get emailed resources delivered to your inbox on a regular basis. So I hope that blesses you. I hope that helps you. I hope that clears up some confusion and that God gives us wisdom to be able to demonstrate compassion without compromise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Come on, one more time. It takes some courage. Thank you, Linda. nobody moving around unless you have to. I want to close with one last thing. Because we can't just talk and then not put action. We can't just think about it and not take a moment to pray about it. Amen, right? It's so important. And we're going to get set up to close with one final song. And I'm, I'm so inclined to let you hear the song because the minute we made the decision to bring Linda in and to hit this topic, Brandon Lake released a song called So Close, and it was about his struggle with mental health 
but it's about our struggle with just the chaos and the noise of this world. If today doesn't move you and you aren't moved in your heart to want to do something to help or to change, then my heart goes out to you. Because we're living in a culture where God is calling us to do something. And if you don't know what to do, maybe today you can get some compassion to get on your knees and to pray for a community that desperately needs mothers and fathers and big brothers and big sisters to reach out and pray for freedom and for hope, to be the Johns in their life. Because if it wasn't for John, where would Linda be? Do we care? And I believe 2911 that we care. I believe that God's put us in this city, that God has put us in this place in culture and history to care, to do something. And so I'm going to ask everybody to stand if you would. I find it interesting. This is one of those subjects where even though we're having a great conversation today, a lot of us still feel very funny, maybe in the conversation, unsure. And I want you to know that there's no condemnation in this house. None. Zip. Zero. I want you to know as your spiritual dad that we love you no matter where you're coming from. You might have a son or a daughter that's struggling with same-sex attraction and you're here today going, I just need to pray for them. Maybe you're here and you are struggling with that. And you're like, I don't know what to do. This is your moment of change. Maybe you're here today and you've got a friend, a coworker, somebody at school that you know, and you want to pray. It doesn't matter the what. What matters is the reason that you would be willing to step out of your chair and come down to this altar and find that God is closer than you could ever imagine regarding this subject matter. In the book of 1 Kings, Elijah is having this moment where it's so loud he can't hear. He's running from something that's making him afraid. The earthquake, the wind, the chaos. And where does he hear God? In the whisper. And when we settle it all down and we find a place to get on our knees, in our heart, in the physical way, we can hear what God's saying. And he's saying, I got you. 